Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels, and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 4. Gaieties Nonetheless, these young girls filled this grave house with charming souvenirs. At certain hours, childhood sparkled in that cloister. The recreation hour struck. A door swung on its hinges. The birds said, good, here come the children. Interruption of youth inundated that garden, intersected with a cross like a shroud. Radiant faces, white foreheads, innocent eyes, full of merry light, all sorts of auroras were scattered about amid these shadows. After the psalmodies, the bells, the peals, and knells and offices, the sound of these little girls burst forth on a sudden more sweetly than the noise of bees. A hive of joy was opened, and each one brought her honey. They played. They called to each other. They formed into groups. They ran about. Pretty little white teeth chattered in the corners. The veils superintended the laughs from a distance. Shades kept watch of the sunbeams. But what mattered it? Still, they beamed and laughed. Those four lugubrious walls had their moment of dazzling brilliancy. They looked on, vaguely blanched with the reflection of so much joy at the sweet swarming of the hives. It was like a shower of roses falling athwart this house of mourning. The young girls frolicked beneath the eyes of the nuns, the gaze of impeccability does not embarrass innocence. Thanks to these children, there was among so many austere hours one hour of ingeniousness. The little ones skipped about. The elder ones danced. In this cloister, play was mingled with heaven. Nothing is so delightful and so august as all these fresh, expanding young souls. Homer would have come thither to laugh with Peralt. And there was, in that black garden, youth health, noise, cries, giddiness, pleasure, happiness enough to smooth out the wrinkles of all their ancestresses. Those of the epic as well as those of the fairy tale. Those of the throne as well as those of the thatched cottage from Hecuba to Le Mer Grand. In that house more than anywhere else, perhaps, arise those children's sayings which are so graceful and which evoke a smile that is full of thoughtfulness. It was between those four gloomy walls that a child of five years exclaimed one day, Mother, one of the big girls, just told me that I have only nine years and ten months longer to remain here. What happiness. It was here, too, that this memorable dialogue took place. A vocal mother. Why are you weeping, my child? The child, aged six. I told Alex that I knew my French history. She says that I do not know it, but I do. Alex, the big girl, aged nine. No, she does not know it. The mother. How is that, my child? Alex. She told me to open the book at random and to ask her any question in the book and she would answer it. Well, she did not answer it. Let us see about it. What did you ask her? I opened the book at random, as she proposed, and I put the first question that I came across. And what was the question? It was, what happened after that? It was there that the profound remark was made anent a rather greedy paraquet which belonged to a lady boarder. 
How well-bred. It eats the top of the slice of bread and butter just like a person. It was on one of the flagstones of this cloister that there was once picked up a confession which had been written out in advance, in order that she might not forget it by a sinner of seven years. Father, I accuse myself of having been avaricious. Father, I accuse myself of having been an adulteress. Father, I accuse myself of having raised my eyes to the gentleman. It was on one of the turf benches of this garden that a rosy mouth six years of age improvised the following tale, which was listened to by blue eyes aged four and five years. There were three little cocks who owned a country where there were a great many flowers. They plucked the flowers and put them in their pockets. After that, they plucked the leaves and put them in their playthings. There was a wolf in that country. There was a great deal of forest, and the wolf was in the forest, and he ate the little cocks. And this other poem. There came a blow with a stick. It was Punchinello who bestowed it on the cat. It was not good for her. It hurt her. Then a lady put Punchinello in prison. It was there that a little abandoned child, a foundling whom the convent was bringing up out of charity, uttered this sweet and heartbreaking saying. She heard the others talking of their mothers, and she murmured in her corner, As for me, my mother was not there when I was born. There was a stout portress who could always be seen hurrying through the corridors with her bunch of keys, and whose name was Sister Agatha. The big, big girls, those of her ten years of age, called her Agathocles. The refectory, a large apartment of an oblong square form, which received no light except through a vaulted cloister on a level with the garden, was dark and damp, and, as the children say, full of beasts. All the places round about furnished their contingent of insects. Each of its four corners had received, in the language of the pupils, a special and expressive name. There was Spider Corner, Caterpillar Corner, Woodlouse Corner, and Cricket Corner. Cricket Corner was near the kitchen and was highly esteemed. It was not so cold there as elsewhere. From the refectory, the names had passed to the boarding school, and there served as in the old college Mazarin to distinguish four nations. Every pupil belonged to one of these four nations according to the corner of the refectory in which she sat at meals. One day, Monseigneur the Archbishop, while making his pastoral visit, saw a pretty little rosy girl with beautiful golden hair enter the classroom through which he was passing. He inquired of another pupil, a charming brunette with rosy cheeks who stood near him. Who is that? She is a spider, Monseigneur. Bah, and that one yonder? She is a cricket. And that one? She is a caterpillar. Really? And yourself? I am a woodlouse, Monseigneur. Every house of this sort has its own peculiarities. At the beginning of this century, Ecoin was one of those strict and graceful places where young girls pass their childhood in a shadow that is almost August. At Ecoin, in order to take rank in the procession of the Holy Sacrament, a distinction was made between virgins and florists. There were also the dais and the censers, the first who held the cords of the dais and the other who carried incense before the Holy Sacrament. The flowers belonged by right to the florists. Four virgins walked in advance. On the morning of that great day, it was no rare thing to hear the question put in the dormitory, Who is the virgin? Madame Campen used to quote this saying of a little one of seven years to a big girl of sixteen, who took the head of the procession, while she, the little one, remained at the rear. You are a virgin, but I am not. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.